Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality. Good morning, everybody. This is Brian Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. You know, this morning we have a Georgetown law professor, Mr. Anthony Cook, on the line with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning, Brother Vernon. How are you doing? I'm doing just great. Doing just great. Excellent. First thing I want to ask you is, what do you teach at Georgetown? I teach a range of courses, uh, Vernon. Uh, I teach a okay. larger lecture course in race, inequality, and progressive politics. It's kind of like a race and democracy course with a focus on voting rights. And I teach um, you know, smaller seminar and experiential education courses like community development, um, law, entrepreneurship, and social innovation. And uh, I'm going to teach a course that I'm very excited about in the spring of 21 on cooperatives. You're going to teach a course on cooperatives? Well, listen, I like to take all of those classes, man. That sounds exciting. Great, Lord. Love to have you, Matt. Culture. All of my courses are like, you know, intended to, you know, really have students engage the community with some real issues, right, to get some substantive experience on how things are working and operating on the ground in these various areas. And so I would typically uh, bring in you know, guests from outside who will audit the course, who have expertise in the field. I'm doing that uh, this summer in a community development seminar, collaborating and working with a group uh, in Anacostia. And it's just extraordinarily rewarding for the students to have both the theory and the practice and to see their work actually be applied to uh, particular problems in the community. So you're welcome. You're welcome. Oh, so I don't have to pay the... Georgetown prices of that tuition? I, brother, I got it all worked out for you. <laughs> <laughs> You're always welcome. <laughs> so how did you get into this co-op world? You're not in business. You're teaching community development, race and religion. How, how did you get into co-ops? Well, you know, look, it, it starts with, you know, really my upbringing, I guess, that we'll talk about it in a little while because it's all kind of connected to, you know, my, my early life and, and my experiences and things being uh, cooperative and uh, being involved in a mutual enterprise of solidarity without those names being attached to it. But more specifically with regard to teaching and, and, and working in this field, believe it or not, you know, my conversion happened uh, last summer. It was like uh, Paul on the Damascus Road, almost. You know, it's like I mm. saw the light. <laughs> I, I went to, to Mondragon to study cooperatives, you know, for a couple of weeks, taking classes across the day, and in the evening, just talking to workers and hanging out with them at bars and stuff like that, and just walked away from the experience, you know, just really kind of transformed in many ways. I traveled there with the idea of just kind of like learning more about it from the intellectual perspective, but it really became almost a spiritual journey, you know, that affected and impacted me very deeply. As you know, that, that community was founded in 56 by a Jesuit priest, Father Jose Maria Asmende, for short, you know, just to be well, short with his name. And the Mondragon Cooperative, you know, currently consists of like this 102 federated cooperatives employing over 73,000 people. But the interesting thing about it is that 
when he came there, you know, in 1943, I think it was, and, and launched this in the early 50s with a few of his students, Mondragon was among the poorest districts in the entire country of Spain. And 50 years later, it was among the wealthiest and most well off, best, well, you know, most well off districts in all of Spain. That transformation over just a half a century intrigued me. It was remarkable to me. So the more I studied the system, the more I realized, you know, why it was founded by this Christian Jesuit priest, because, you know, his commitment to those who are left out, who are left behind, the least of these was, was unmistakable to me. So, uh, you know, I, it, it really kind of started there. So I came back to the States, committed to studying it in, in more detail, and then trying to orient my community engagement around building and furthering this ecosystem, right? Uh, and meeting great people like you with the Cooperative of Stakeholders Group in D.C. and other people I've been uh, very fortunate to meet. I just become aware that, you know, there's this whole world out here of people whose orientation and commitment in the blending of, you know, theory and practice uh, resonates very deeply and profoundly with me. And I just, I just love being around and in this community. So it really, it really was life, life altering. So I got this conversion piece. I'm going to go all the way back to where you started because my Damascus Road conversion was similar. It took me a little bit uh -huh. longer than one summer. But just for those that don't know, Paul was riding on the road and God spoke to him and he turned, he turned from killing Christians to uh, becoming one. Uh, and that was a right. huge conversion. So you got converted from what, from capitalistic capitalist to a cooperative or what was your conversion? What was it? Oh, no, no, no. Um, I was definitely always a critic of, uh, of capitalism and systemic forms of uh, oppression, institutionalized and st structural forms of racism and oppression. I was one of the uh, co-founders of a movement in legal academy called critical race theory. And so um, I had long been about the task of kind of interrogating, you know, white supremacy and racism and how it was uh, deleterious and, and problematic to, you know, solidarity, even among black, white and people of color workers and communities. Right. So that had always been a commitment of mine. And I was a follower and scholar of, of King, Martin Luther King, Jr., and was uh, very much a proponent of his beloved community and his kind of transformative, you know, progressive theology that focused on the least of these. You know, King said the year before he was assassinated that, you know, as clergy, we're called upon to feed the 40 million beggars in America's marketplace. But sooner or later, we have to start uh, asking ourselves, why are there 40 million poor people in America? Any Jericho Road that produces 40 million poor people is in need of, of transformation. And that requires us to start asking questions about the capitalist system, about who owns the oil, who owns the iron ore. You know, why do we have to pay for water in a world that's two-thirds water? Uh, we have to have a revolution in values, he says, that uh, moves us from being focused on things and money and possessions to being focused on people and community and uh, a love-based justice that is about, you know, letting uh, waters flow down like mighty rivers and, and righteousness like a mighty stream. So I come out of that tradition, you see. And so I always had a okay. healthy critique of capitalism in that way. But my answer and solution for it was always kind of rooted in the world of justice lawyering and community development you know, which was uh, kind of all about trying to build the capacity of people in under and disinvested communities and figuring out how the law can progressively be used to challenge systems that keep people marginalized and oppressed, whether it's in voting rights, a course that I teach, or criminal law, a uh, course that I have taught in the past, constitutional law, or what have you, right? So that was always a focus. So I've had these sensibilities and this orientation for a long time. Cooperatives provided for me a way in which all of these concerns kind of converge, both the critique of systems of injustice and a constructive outlet for building a beloved community. 
building a vision of the world that we wanted to see and not just be satisfied with the world that we have. That's what cooperatives did for me, is doing for me. All right. I got amen, brother. (laughs) Amen, brother. Okay, that's what I had out here. Amen. Yeah, so it wasn't so much a conversion as an add-on. Uh, you Maybe you were already right. in this that's space. Right. You were in this yeah. world. Mine was a conversion. I was capitalist. I went and got my MBA. I wanted to make money. I started a property management business to make money. Didn't make any money that's in it. that, but I made some money in real estate, okay, owning uh, uh-huh. my own real estate. So total capitalist. So mine was a conversion when I saw limited equity housing co-op every day, Pretty much Uh black folk, black women running these businesses. And sometimes they didn't have a high school education. Right. They made great decisions, long-term decisions. And that was through the fifth principle of co-ops of training information. Okay, this old learning piece. And and it's like just in time, uh, because I've also taught for 12 years of my life, and I like this just in time knowledge. So they get knowledge to learn how to run a business, and I'm going, wow. This is fantastic. And so the more it took me about five years to get converted, okay, okay. And, and studying. Okay. You, you got it in the summer. Yeah. You, you're smarter than I am. It took me a little <laughs> bit longer, but I got it. I got converted. I got this bug. And yeah. the reason for this radio show is because most people don't know about co-ops. And most black mm-hmm. people don't know about co-ops. Mm-hmm. And sure. Sure. we don't think, don't think it's there, but there's a lot of cooperativism even if we don't call it co-op, you talked about that in your early life, the kinds of things that you were doing. It wasn't called co-op, solidarity and working together and all of that. It's mm-hmm. automatically in a black community. So let's take one of these classes, one of these classes that you have. Which one would you like to go into more detail on? Let me just start with the, um, the, the practicum that I teach called Law, Entrepreneurship and Social Innovation, because it'll give you a sense of, where my seminar that I'll teach for the first time in the spring on cooperatives will eventually move. You know, one of the reasons why I came to Georgetown is because Georgetown has a, a splendid reputation, I think ranked number one in the country, with regard to its clinical and experiential education. And, um, you know, our motto at law school is, you know, um, justice is the end, law is but the means, right? And uh, for mm. a person with, of, of my ilk with my background, you know, that really resonated with me, and it was one of the reasons why I came, because I wanted to be in a community that, of course, I knew, you know, there's always a divide between what you say you believe and your values and, and what you actually do, because we are all human, and, uh, you know, those frailties exist. We're all sinners and saved by grace. But it's, 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 it's good to have that as your articulated value, your goal, what you try to do. And so our clinical and experiential education program is all about trying to bridge the gap between the vast resources that a place like Georgetown Law has uh, and communities that are marginalized and or, you know, segregated and uh, or oppressed in so many ways with regard to uh, the distributions of wealth, income and, and power. Uh, so this practicum I'm teaching, law, entrepreneurship and social innovation, what I do is I'll take 15 students. I admit 15 students every year, just about. And we will, I'll, you know, select and vet clients throughout D.C. that are clients uh, that are startup and early stage uh, enterprises that are focused on social impact work. You know, I want clients who are trying to impact under and disinvested communities and are coming up with products and services to accomplish that. You know, uh, I like to support you know, entrepreneurs of color, because there's so little support out there for entrepreneurs of color and women entrepreneurs in this ecosystem. So I look for those uh, groups uh, very, very closely. And uh, we'll provide a range of legal and business expertise to them over the course of the semester and sometimes a year, sometimes delivering $100,000, $150,000 or more of pro bono assistance to them over this period of time to shore them up, to bolster them, and to provide a platform for uh, their success. Uh, So the students are working 15 hours a week on a particular matter for a client, uh, and then they come into the seminar, and we will take, you know, their experiences and talk about it, you know, problem solve and 
deal with the issues that they are experiencing and representing those clients. And uh, we'll also take them through the life cycle of a typical small business from the you know, starting point of someone who has a great idea, who really has a passion for entrepreneurship, and they're working for an employer. And they're trying to figure out how they can leave that employer and take their idea with them without having that employer come back and sue them uh, for having stolen their intellectual property, so forth and so on. We'll take them from that starting point all the way through putting a board together. How do you do that? You know, what entity do you choose for your venture? You know, where do you you raise money? What are the rounds of raising money? What are angel investors? What's, you know, seed capital? What's your series one, you know, venture capital raise? You know, when do you acquire other businesses or sell your business or, you know, do an IPO, an initial public offering to raise more money? We take them through the whole life cycle, even through dissolution. So the course that I'm teaching in in cooperatives is going to do something similar to that eventually. In a year or so, I'll have a practicum that's based around cooperatives, where students will be two hours in class and spending 15 hours hours a week uh, working for uh, the, working on the legal and business matters pertaining to cooperatives in this area and in this region. Uh, so listen, yeah. Professor Cook, we'll be right back. We're going to talk about this. You're at Georgetown. Justice is the end. Law is the means. We're going to figure out how you got here. How do you get to Georgetown? We'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Your news talk station. Information is power. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We have Professor Anthony E. Cook online with us today, and we, he was talking to how he got into the cooperative world, and that's just exciting. But, Anthony, I'd like to go back a bit. Where did you grow up? What kind of education did you have? What were some of those things that you did to show solidarity working together, this community that wasn't called co-ops, that sort of helped to lead you here? And I also want to know, it's a lot of questions, how did you get into law? You know, okay. Yeah, that's I was a lot. born. So if, if, I forget, if I forget some of them, you, you, you remind me I on the way, okay? But look, I, man, I grew up in Magnolia, Mississippi, southwest Mississippi, uh, right on the Mississippi-Louisiana border, right? Uh, on that stretch of interstate called I-55, uh, the stretches all the way from, you know, Louisiana up through Chicago. I was right between New Orleans, Louisiana, where I had plenty of relatives, and Jackson, Mississippi, Right. That area, Pike County, Mississippi, was a hotbed for civil rights activities. You know, everybody knows about the 64 murder of Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner and being buried uh, buried under the earthen dam in uh, the Delta, Philadelphia, Mississippi, right? But my area in Mississippi was no less robust and active with all kinds of civil rights engagement. You know, one of my earliest memories as a little kid was coming out uh, on my porch, and the church was, you know, right across the road. Not right across the street, but right across the dirt right road, the road from my I house, right? <laughs> okay. And seeing a cross, a Ku Klux Klan cross being burned there, right? And my mother coming out and screaming and taking me up in her arms and bring me back into the house. And, you know, uh, our pastor was active in the civil rights movement. Uh, provided the church as a space, as was the case back then, for many of the meetings during that period of time, and was targeted by the Klan and threatened by the Klan on a regular basis. We had churches not far from us that were bombed by the Klan, all that kind of stuff, right? So I grew up as a kid after the Voting Rights Act and, you know, the Fair Housing Act of 68, the three big legislation of statutes during that period was 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the 68 Fair Housing Act. So when I really come of age, it's right after that period of time. But we have now transitioned, you know, uh, in the 70s into the period of reaction, of redemption, of a the knee-jerk backlash to the gains and progress of the civil rights movement. And so I lived through the backlash without having really kind of lived through the formative period of those who were involved in the struggle to create the gains that now people were responding to, and there was a backlash too. So 
I grew up in a poor household. My mom had an eighth grade education. My dad had a third grade education. You know, we were recipients of the welfare state, food stamps, and government cheese. When in the conservative era, you know, that's what the government was giving poor people, and people had to line up to get cheese. And but that cheese was provision. good. That cheese but, was good, man. Cheese was good, though, man, right? And you had to know how to work it and, and, and integrate it into any number of dishes, bro. And you do that, and that's what poor people do. And that's part of the solidarity movement, though, because, you know, when you're in a community that, you know, does not have very much, as far as material wealth is concerned, then you learn to really harvest uh, the bounty of everything and, and to be very frugal and to not be wasteful with things. So in the fall, all the men in the community would gather and uh, slaughter hogs. And, you know, in, in our yard, you know, we would hang up the hog, slaughter the hog. And I mean, every part of that hog was used for some purpose. Uh, even the hooves, you know, were boiled down and turned into soap. Um, you know, the oh, you, you had soap. We ate them. It was pig feet, man. We had pig feet. With oh, now we ate the flesh. I'm just talking about the okay. toenails, the hard. Okay, ones, right? <laughs> okay. We, okay. We didn't. We didn't even throw that away, Vernon. Is what I'm saying. Okay. Right? <laughs> oh, we, I, we didn't know how to do that. Maybe we didn't have that much. But you know, it was, what you're getting to is how we took the crumbs off the masses table or anywhere yeah. else we could find them. And we right. made good out of it. We made, we made a delicacy out of nothing. Made a delicacy out of nothing. Absolutely right. Yeah. And women would, you know, can vegetables and make quilts. And it was a communal enterprise. Our house set up an intersection of three rows converging. And so everybody who was coming into the community would bypass our house. And our porch was like, you know, a gathering place for people in the community. And I vividly remember all of those conversations growing up, the camaraderie, camaraderie and solidarity that existed. When a house burned down, people in the community rebuilt yep. the house, right? When uh, someone died, we didn't get, you know, professional grave diggers to come. The men and the boys dug every grave, right? When the church yard, we didn't have a professional landscaper. Everybody got together Saturday morning in the summers, 5.30 a.m. sharp, right? To oh start mowing the yard and, and, and keeping up the property, repairing the church and everything like that. We had a situation where the church, the school, and the family, the three you know, central pillars of the black community were all integrated in a way because people who were your teachers and your principals, they were in my church, right? And so I'm a poor kid, you know, on the other side of the tracks, but people who are professionals are part of my church. And, and having them there, having their mentorship, having them um, be the director of a Christmas program, you know, uh, of an after-school session in Bible class, uh, that was incredibly important to what was poured into me and to us in that community, which permitted gateways and bridges to be built to opportunity because these people cared about each other. And regardless of your class or status in life, you affiliated and were in solidarity in so many ways with the poor segments of the population, right? Uh, and, and that was a wonderful thing. That has fragmented and dissipated in the years since the civil rights movement for any number of reasons that we may or may not have time to talk about. But given that fragmentation, we don't have the kind of cohesiveness and solidarity that once existed. We have so many situations now in which the churches that I have represented and done some work with, most of their parishioners in D.C. don't live in D.C. They live outside D.C. in the suburbs somewhere, Right. And so they are detached in many ways from the people who were left out and left behind within those communities. Not that they don't care about them, but they aren't there in physical community and solidarity with them. And that means a lot, I think, with regard to our inability to solve and reckon with some of the problems that uh, our communities are facing. So, Brother Cook, I got third grade education with your father, eighth grade with your mother, and you've gone and got a doctorate in law, Jewish doctorate degree. And so we're going to have to take our second break here. But, but you want to know how that because, happened, right? Yeah, yeah I, I, that that is right on the, that, yes. There's a good story uh, behind that. I hope, yeah, I want to talk okay, to you we'll about We'll come that. back and get that story. <laughs> and when we get that story of how that happened, I'm also wanting to, uh, I, I, I see you've got this community development, you have race and inequality, which all fits into the 
the uprival after the George Floyd murder, uh, lynching, if you will. So we're going to get to that, too, particularly with the, the role that co-ops can play. We may not okay. get that to the next segment because I really want to get to how did this thing happen that you went from parents with third and eighth grade education. My dad had an eighth grade education. My mom went back to school and graduated when I was 13 with six kids. She graduated magna cum laude from Bluefield State College. So I had a, a mentor that said, go to college, go to college, go to college. There you go. You there didn't you have go. that in your family. We'll be right back and get that story. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. We have Professor Cook on the line with us this morning, and he was talking about his growing up in Magnolia, Mississippi, between New Orleans and Jackson, Mississippi. And yep. um, that's not the richest part of the, the, the U.S., not even the richest part of Mississippi, kind of like the whole country. That whole side of the country is poor is my understanding of it. And with your parents having third grade, father third grade education, mother eighth grade education, and you went on to get a college degree and then a JD, doctorate of Jewish prudence. So how did that transition happen? Well, you know, look, my oldest sister went off to Jackson State on a basketball scholarship. My family was uh, was struggling. After about two years, she decided and told, uh, you know, mom and dad that she was going to, to drop out and get a job because she had learned basically whatever she needed to learn at Jackson State, and she was good to go. So she she, she stopped uh, uh, playing ball and dropped out of Jackson State, got a job, and started helping uh, our family financially. And she is the reason why me and my sisters really could afford to go off to college, because so much of the money that she made and that her husband made, you know, that money was allocated to support of, of siblings like us. One of the things that she did was that uh, not only did she help us bring running water into the house, because for the first part of my life, we didn't have running water or electricity, right? But she, she, uh, So she, you also yeah. had, a, I'm sorry, but if you didn't have running water, that means you had an outhouse like we did. You had an had you an outhouse, outside. brother. You know about the, okay. you know about right. the outhouses. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. The, the only difference is... is the difference is that it was cold in West Virginia at least four months out, if not six months out of the year. You probably didn't yeah. have that. You had to go out there when it was freezing cold and in the snow. But go ahead. You go. Yeah, go not through. the snow, okay. but freezing cold for sure. It gets oh, colder okay. in Mississippi than people know, uh, people think. Okay. But anyway, she, she also bought me a set of World Book Encyclopedia one year, oh. right? And so mm -hmm. I had World Book Encyclopedia in the house and the Bible. And I read both of them voraciously. And so in like going through the encyclopedia and reading and reading and reading, I one day ran across a term called the Ivy League that intrigued me. Okay. And I started studying the Ivy League. And I think I said to myself one day when I was probably like 14 or so, I'm going to go to an Ivy League school. Didn't know which one, right? So I researched them. And, uh, you know, I eventually applied to a bunch of them. And got into Princeton, and you know my high school counselor said, um, you know, over the intercom, congratulations to Anthony Cook, uh, who just w w got accepted and got a scholarship to Princess Institute, which was a junior college in Mississippi. She had never heard <laughs> of Princeton, right? <laughs> so, so the, the bug about you know wanting to 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 get away to you know to to do better to expand my horizons came from the world being opened up to me through the encyclopedia that my sister invested in and bought for me. Uh, and do me I a favor. Do me a favor, bro. I'm sorry. Do me a favor. Give a shout out by name to your sister. Yeah. On the show. Bo Bobby Jean, my sister, Barbara Bennett, uh, Barbara Cook Bennett. She is, she's like a second mom to me. And uh, she's, she's just been wonderful throughout my life. Uh, as have all my sisters, one has passed away, but uh, she in particular has been like a second mom to me. She's just phenomenal. So there was there okay. was a sacrifice of my sister in solidarity with family, putting self to one side in order to create opportunities for others. That was an incredible example for me, which she had learned right from, yeah, my mother and father who had done the same. My mother was eighth grade educated. 
but she was a Sunday school teacher. And over the years, she became so knowledgeable, so erudite about the scripture. I mean, she knew nothing about hermeneutics, the theories of interpretation, or homiletics, the theories of preaching, and uh, all the kind of, you know, exegesis of scriptures that theologians engage in. But my God, she was better than anyone in the community. As a matter of fact, when we got a telephone, the phone was constantly ringing from preachers calling her to get her consultation on what particular scriptures meant. And so I have these vivid memories of her sitting around our kitchen, uh, our small table, and she's got the Bible open. She's got two, three commentaries, a Sunday school book open, and she's looking over her spectacles and glasses and and analyzing and putting pieces (laughs) together, man. And to this day, I wish I could be as good of a teacher as she was in those Sunday school classes. She was phenomenal. So there was that example. I had an example in front of me, like your mom, of someone who was erudite, who took the written word seriously, who took studying and analysis seriously, who took pride in that, right? And mm-hmm. without knowing it myself consciously, I internalized it as something of value, something important. That it became a part yeah, of you. Not, yeah. yeah, it was just part of me, bro. Right? Yeah, And then finally, I'll just say that the church community of which that my family was a part was like that. I was blessed to have a visionary pastor who believed that young people were simply adults, you know, waiting to be. And he didn't put the artificial constraints on young people that many churches do. You know how you'll go into a church sometimes and the church will, you know, okay, it's time for the young people to leave and go to mm. youth church, mm-hmm. right? Separated from the adults, right? In our church, mm-hmm. the youth would often lead services. And when I say lead services, I mean mm-hmm. they would lead devotions. They would be the superintendent of the Sunday school. They would deliver messages. They were front and center. It was a lot of pressure. It was a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility. But as I reflect on it, having those opportunities to develop those soft skills across that period of time, really is what allowed me to bridge the gap when I got to a place like Princeton, because I was coming from a state that had the poorest uh, public education in the country. But because all of the community in solidarity had poured this capacity building into me, this skill development into me, when I got to Princeton, I had to burn the midnight oil to catch up educationally. But I had some skills that far surpassed many of my peers, right? Right My ability to speak and to analyze and to participate in class, my ability to analyze text and to write, right? You know, excelled many of my peers who were coming from the top prep schools in the country. And that came out of the experience of solidarity of Magnolia, Mississippi. Magnolia, Mississippi. (laughs) All right, bro. I got it. Total. And... You take that experience and you said, so when you found about this co-op world, so somehow you found out about it before you went to Mondragon, you went there and you just got this add on from this, here I am in this house with these siblings, these three roads connecting to it with a mom and dad who in this community is just pouring into you Two going to Spain and learning about this and bring it back, taking it to the classroom to other people. That's a phenomenal right. journey, bro. That's a phenomenal journey. Yeah. So you were teaching community development and race and inequality in America, progressive politics. Okay. How do you put all of this into this community development first? How do you, how do you put this cooperativism, this solidarity, this working together, all of these things in community development? Yeah, well, you know, look, um, a course like, you know, race, inequality, progressive politics, focusing on voting rights, uh, was was my uh, attempt to do a few things that I'll try to make succinct. What one was to show students how the struggle for equality and for equity is in America a cyclical journey, right? Black people were brought to America in 1619. I always tell my students that, you know, slavery had existed for almost 150 years before Crispus Attis was the first black man to be killed in the Revolutionary War. 
almost 150 years slavery had existed before the Revolutionary War, the Declaration of Independence in 1776. By the time the Constitution is signed in 1780, ratified in 1787, slavery has been in existence, you know, well over uh, the 150 years. And it would not exist. The Constitution would not have been possible without a compromise with this original sin of America called slavery. Um, and, you know, the three-fifths compromise, which looked at black people as three-fifths human, was uh, supported throughout that document by provisions like the Fugitive Slave Clause that preserve and protected the institution of slavery. Uh, in many ways, you see, slavery and the oppression of black people is as American as cherry pie. It is in, inextricably connected uh, to our identity. And our journey has been a, a journey and struggle to exercise this demon, to somehow disintegrate it from our personality and to, you know, start anew, as Eddie Glaw's book you know, says and states. So we come through the Reconstruction period that begins to reconstruct the American identity and tries to. But that period is short-lived. It only exists from 1865 to 1876. And in 1876, the hayes tilden Compromise completely undermines it. The franchise is taken away. The vote is taken away from black people. Uh, and by the 1890s, the constitutional conventions of just about every state has now taken the vote away from black people. And black people are returned to a status of the subjugated under Jim Crow segregation. Jim Crow segregation last from the 1880s, let's call it 1876, all the way to 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act, you know, almost another hundred years. The second reconstruction that starts with the murder of Emmett Till, the lynching of Emmett Till, and the Montgomery bus boycott the year after in 55, reaches its culmination in 1968 with the passage of three second reconstructive acts the 64 Civil Rights Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the 68 Fair Housing Act. As we know, Bobby Kennedy is assassinated, King is assassinated in 68, Richard Nixon wins the White House on a platform of law and order, and begins the second period of redemption or backlash against progressive gains. So look at there, only three years or so of progressive reform from 64 to 68 and the backlash starts anew. And we have been on the trajectory of that backlash to the gains of the civil rights movement for the last 40 years. Trump is not the beginning of that. He is a manifestation of that long history. So I want to take that and put that in historical context so that my students can understand that the struggle is never complete. It is always ongoing in many ways, right? Right. And that is what I bring into community development, that sense of history that says we are in community development and co-op development for the long run here. This is not a quick fix solution. It took more than 300 years, 400 years for these conditions to be created. It's going to take hundreds of years for them to be deconstructed and reconstructed. But the journey must start somewhere. So it should start. It's got to yeah. start. Yeah. I love it, buddy. I love it. I love it. I love it. You 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 put in such succinct ways. You, the way you articulate it is great. Uh, I've been there. I haven't been able to articulate it the way you've just done it, particularly with that that history. Only eleven years in that first reconstruction, and three years in that second reconstruction, and always yeah. in on the backlash, going back toward three fifths of a man, three fifths of a right. human being, going back there. Okay, and exactly. so this long run way of getting this community development and getting co-ops is it has to be long. We have to overcome all of this now, five, 400 That's years. Right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to come back and talk about what we have to do over this long run to change this around in this third okay. reconstruction. Cool. And maybe it can stay longer than three or 11 years. Right. So that, so that we blacks, Brown, Hispanics, and Natives can have a better quality of life. We'll be right there back. There you go. Your news.
News Talk Station. Information is power. That's why WOL is a great partner, and NCB, the National Cooperative Bank, has been the sponsor for this program. And they have been a great supporter, uh, not only financially, but really helping us with ideas on what we could talk about, introducing us to people we can talk to. National Co-op Bank's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. Those low-income communities, uh, Professor Cook, as you know, or most a lot of the black and brown people live in those, the Native Americans, particularly those the Navajo Nation are going through a lot of COVID problems. They're low income communities. So this long run this long run fix of this always taking us back to three fifths of a man is to help these I want to take it even broader to marginalized communities. Any marginalized yeah. community, what it may That's look right. like. Uh, my focus being African Americans. I assume your focus being African Americans is the black community, but my heart is really out for our native brothers and sisters and what no question President Mind Trump it. and them are doing to to the brown folks and taking their kids away and putting them in cages and stuff is just to me totally inhumane. Uh, right. So it's any marginalized people, anybody that has been hurt. What can we do? So what do you see, particularly using Georgetown? Justice is the end, and law is the means. What is it that we can do that let co-ops help us get this long-term view and this long-term manifestation of these marginalized communities no longer being marginalized, having financial and social wealth, that that we can create that for these folks, particularly folks of color? Yeah. Look, uh, look. We're li- we're living in a society at a time in which the the the, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is growing more intense. Uh, wages have basically you know stagnated since the seventies, as everyone knows. As we've moved from uh, you know a manufacturing economy to a service economy, with jobs being segregated on both ends of the extreme low-paying uh, service industry jobs and high-paying uh, expertise and technical jobs. <clears throat> And you know the the, the um, innovation and creativity, imagination of, of of capitalist financiers and the rich in innovating products to uh, extract more wealth uh, from um, the middle class and uh, underclass has has uh, shown no no sense of limit. We we now live in a world in which in America, you know, three human beings uh, own more wealth than half of the population of this country. And in the world, eight human beings own more wealth than half the population of the world. Uh, and this shows no signs of abatement. And so just the opposite. Uh, it shows signs that it's going to get bigger. Yes. That those eight people will maybe own more wealth than 60 percent or 70 percent of America the way it's go. going, even during this pandemic. Got it, bro. Even during the pandemic. You're absolutely right. And so I'm all about a justice as ownership model of community development. Uh, and justice as ownership means that uh, I want to see poor and marginalized people of all races and colors in every location throughout the world, throughout the country, be able to own not only the processes of their self-determination, but also the results of their uh, self-determination, their own organizations and institutions. Cooperatives that are uh, focused on user-owned and user-controlled entities, whether they are worker co-ops, consumer or producer co-ops, allows us to, I think, close those gaps. In a traditional business or corporation that I taught for many years, um, the process is, you know, the the entity is a very extractive one in that, you know, shareholders who own the company and many times don't live in the communities where the business is located, um, you know, get significant, you know, profits from that business or surplus from that business. Um, and those surpluses come in the terms, uh, in terms of uh, dividends that are distributed, stock buyback, share back buybacks, and other perks that shareholders get. Executives, highly paid executives in major corporations, are, are another source for the distribution of that surplus. Uh, in America, under conservative estimates, 
Uh, the you know, average CEO's earnings are 376 times that of the average worker, and that continues to, to grow. And so what's left then for workers? In the cooperative, what I like is that uh, the dollars, the money, is recycled into the cooperative to basically raise the wages of workers, the benefits for workers, uh, and to grow the wealth of not only the workers, uh, but also the community within which the cooperative is located. Uh, in the, the empirical data uh, indicates to me in no uncertain terms that cooperatives tend to be more resilient during down cycles. Uh, and even during periods of like COVID, there are some cooperatives that you know, are hanging on because of the, uh, you know, earnings that they retain uh, and, uh, you know, the commitment that they have to the community. They very seldom leave those communities, shut down and leave like other factories. Uh, and workers tend to have a greater quality of life, enjoy their work more, get paid better with greater benefits. And the ancillary benefits for poor and marginalized communities is that this is not welfare. It's not like, you know, giving someone money. They're involved in a daily enterprise that grows their capacity, their skill development, kind of like the church that I grew up in, the community that we just finished talking about in the other segment. People uh, become better leaders. They become more vocal. They learn business skills and how businesses operate. Uh, there are studies that indicate that, you know, if you branch off from a cooperative and start your own business, you're still more likely to stay in the community, and it becomes an incubator for your entrepreneurial desires and, and directions that you take with your own business in many instances. Uh, in so many ways, it answers the bell on a number of issues that plague poor, marginalized communities in capacity building, wealth generation individually and collectively, recirculating dollars within the community and growing the community from the inside out. Uh, I think cooperatives are serious solution that have to be grown in order to deal with the issues of systemic poverty and systemic racism. How we get there of growing the ecosystem for cooperatives requires us to really think seriously, I think, about how laws can be made to better support this ecosystem, how rotating capital funds and financing vehicles that allow cooperatives to maintain control of their enterprises, but still get, without jeopardizing that, the capital that is necessary to start, grow, and scale cooperatives within the community. We have to start really thinking, I think, about, about that uh, as well. And the educational component, which I hope to play a part of in, in Georgetown, in raising the educational awareness of what cooperatives are, how positive and impactful they are to the marginalized communities, and the need to throw institutional resources like those at Georgetown behind the support and growth of this sector if we are to be about what we say we are about, justice being the end, you know, creating and training and educating students for others and for the community. If we're about that, we should be able to commit, I think, to cooperatives. And particularly a place like Georgetown, because, you know, Mondragon was started by a Jesuit priest, right? And right. Georgetown is a Jesuit school. I mean, this, this, this should be a no-brainer for an institution like Georgetown. <laughs> so, so I've been trying to get Reverend Barber on this show. He talks just like you from a standpoint of what to do for the least of these and poor people campaign, taking on MLK's poor people campaign. But I've been trying to get him to understand the co-op world. Uh, he, his solution to them all have been, from, my, from what I've seen, a political answer. And I think there's a place for political, but it also has to be economic. And I think co-op is the answer to that. I've also been trying to get the Pope on the show. So if you have any way through the, through the Jesuit priest to get to this Jesuit priest. His family, I've been told, his father set him and his brothers down and told them about the benefits of co-ops. Okay. Oh, good. So I'm wanting to hear that story from him. So i got got to figure out how to get him on. So this whole world of the co-op principles, the first one is self-help. Self-responsibility mm -hmm. is the second one. Okay. Then is the ethical, there's a bunch more, the ethical principles 
of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for one another. The golden rule, which is in almost every faith-based tradition, yes. some form of the golden rule. So it fits in for all of the right reasons. And, sir, you have really articulated extremely well. minute or so left, what do you want to leave people with? What's the message you want to leave them with? Um, first of all, I just I want to commend you and programs like you because, you know, what the studies indicate is that, you know, is um, – the lack of education is a serious problem with regard to growing this ecosystem uh, because we learn about corporations, limited liability companies, all that kind of stuff, but we really don't learn about the cooperative model. So although so many Americans use cooperatives, I think it may be one out of four or whatever, use some form of cooperative. When asked, you know, what is a cooperative and how does it work, don't really know a whole lot about it. We've got to change that, I think, right, and move this more into the mainstream. So please, those who are listening, continue to educate yourself on this as, as I am doing. Uh, find some way of engaging the problem through, um, you know, creating a stakeholder group, um, starting a small conversation and small collaborative group that may grow into uh, a uh, cooperative at some point in time. Uh, learn by doing. Right. That's what I like so much about cooperatives. You learn by doing right. Amen. So all listeners here, you know, commit yourself to learning about this, not just abstractly, but learning by doing. Roll up your sleeves, get involved and start this long hundred year process of building the kind of institutions we need to reverse the histories of systemic racism and inequality that plague so many of our under and disinvested communities. Thank you, Professor Cook. Thank you so much. Everybody out there, it's been great conversation. We'll see you next week. Please live cooperatively and learn about this model.